Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to our second installment on our series on the Gilded Age. And there is absolutely no way to discuss the Gilded Age without discuss discussing those individuals that some referred to as the robber, robber barons, the titans of industry, the captains of capital, those men that emerged after the war. Um, out of the industrial north to become the new economic and some may even say political ruling class of this country as this country transformed into an industrial powerhouse these were the men at the top of that transformation but let me present to you a question a question of debate uh, a debate that's gone on ever since if essentially we are going to explore the question well just exactly who were the people that made this country into what it is today namely uh the wealthiest most power economically powerful country in the world this economic powerhouse if you will and if we were to trace that back to um, this period in the late 19th century that the United States not only rapidly industrialized, but caught up to and surpassed its industrial competitors around the world. Who deserves that credit? Is it the men that steered these industries towards becoming the wealthiest, uh, in many cases, industries on the planet? Or was it the people? the millions of unnamed, unremembered, everyday working people that through their labor, they built this country into what it was. And that's gonna be a conversation that we're going to lead into, not just today, but in the next several videos. And it is, it's a point of contention. Who were the men and women that made America? Or what was it? They, was it and even the term the use of the term the robber barons that was not a term that was used um as a term of endearment but on the contrary it was uh disparaging uh, what was once in the beginning um a point of inspiration uh you know admiration by the end of this period um, public opinion looks very differently at, at these people at the top, at the economic top of, of, of the food chain, the once upon time heroes, the titans of industry, the captains of capital. Um, public opinion starts to look at them differently, and that's where the term the robber barons appears. So let's explore some of this. And let's explore possibly uh, the, the first real big... Um, firms that emerge after the war, particularly in transportation. Um, the first railroad tycoons. And the first of the railroad tycoons was uh, a gentleman by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was raised, um, most of these guys were raised into wealthy families. Okay, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt's daddy ran a steamboat service. Uh, in, out of New York City, um, Cornelius did pretty much the same thing. I mean, that's a rich guy's name, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> um, by 1863, um, using the money that he had made in steamboats, he goes over into railroads. Um, and he buys control of the New York and Harlem Railroad. Okay, and then he uses that as a springboard to by uh, even more railroads in the New York City uh, vicinity. Within three years, he owns three more railroads, consolidating all four into the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad, one of the first giant corporations in United States history. By 1871, he completed construction. He completed construction of the Grand of Grand Central Depot, which is today Grand Central Station. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, he would by buying up railroad tracks, um, 
<clears throat> in this competition with the Erie Railroad, he would uh, be able to complete the first uh, rail line from New York to Chicago. By the time he dies, which is in uh, <clears throat> 1877, he's worth $105 million. Well, that would be $143 billion in, 200, in 2007 dollars, by the way. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, you know, nicknamed the Commodore, was perhaps the first of these railroad tycoons, but he certainly wouldn't be the last. Um, you have Jay Gould, a uh, railroad magnate himself and financial speculator. A lot of these guys got into railroads because they saw the profits. They were speculators. They were investors. They bought stock and sold stock. Not that they were railroad men at heart, but they end up at the head of the country's biggest railroad company. So back again, Jay Gould, railroad magnate and financial speculator, his unscrupulous business practices made him one of the U.S.'s wealthiest men. Controversial and unpopular during his life, Gould regarded, was regarded as one of the great villains of his era. Um, for the most part, he always worked with his partner, James Fisk. Um, he was able to acquire the Erie Railroad um, in 1868 through the betrayal of partners and illegal stock manipulation. He took control of the Union Pacific Railroad in 1873 when its stock was depressed by the Panic of 1873. We call this bottom feeding. By 1879, Gould gained control of three more important Western railroads, including the Missouri Pacific Railroad. <clears throat> he ended up controlling more than 10,000 miles of railway, about one-ninth of the rail in the United States at that time. Jay Cook, banker by trade, uh, began building the Northern Pacific Railroad in 1870 out of Duluth, but overinvested and lost it all in the Panic of 1873. And then we have Mr. Stanford, Leland Stanford, that's where Stanford University is named after, um, investor and president of the Central Pacific in 1861. In 1864, he assumed the presidency of the Occidental and Oriental Steamship Company, the steamship line to Japan and China, which was associated with the Central Pacific Railroad. Stanford was president of the Southern Pacific Railroad from 1885 and eight to 1890. Oh, and by the way, Leland Stanford was the individual that at the ceremony on May 10th, 1869 to drive the Golden Spike, completing the Transcontinental Railroad. He would drive the Golden Spike into the ground, completing that task. So we had our railroad back. So those were the first, you know, <clears throat> uber wealthy, if you will, industrialists that emerged out of the post-Civil War years. But just like there's going to be railroad magnets, there's going to be people that are going to make fortunes in, in many of the new emerging industries. Remember, this is new money. These are the folks that are replacing the old money, the old merchants of New England and the landed aristocracy planter class of the South. These are people that are making fortunes in 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 new industries that are just starting to emerge. I mean, they're old money to us now, but at the time, they were very much seen as new money. Although a good number of them came from old money themselves. And you can't have railroads without having rails. And you can't have dependable rails without being made of dependable metal. This image here is showing us the Bessemer process. We had coal, we had heat thanks to, uh, we had iron, we had heat thanks to coal, add them together with, you know, some more tweaking there, you know, the adding of additional metals, da da da. Uh, basically, it's hot air blowing through iron, burning out the carbon impurities, leaving us with steel and all the incredible applications the superior metal gave us. Now, the Bessemer process was invented in Great Britain. Um, but the man that would come and make a fortune in steel, okay, the steel magnet, he was not an engineer or a metallurgist. He was not the guy that figured out how to do this. He was the guy that figured out how to make a fortune of it. 
by mass producing it. That brings us to Mr. Andrew Carnegie, industrialist steel magnet, one of the wealthiest men of the Gilded Age. Um, he was one of the few that could actually say he came from poverty. An immigrant from, from, from Scotland, he worked, saved his pennies, invested in the stock market, and after a number of years, he has a, a good little egg, a nest egg of money to, to invest in, in, in a business, and he wants to put it into steel after having visited Scotland and observed a, a demonstration of the Bessemer process. He says, well, here in the U.S., we have coal, we have iron, we have a large population, a large demand for steel. You know, we could really make this thing blow up here. Uh, in 1873, <clears throat> um, he would enter the steel business. Um, by 1899, his Carnegie Company was the world's leading steel producer. Eventually, he's going to sell, sell his company in 1900 and his reasons for it. Already, there, he, he did get hit with a lot of controversy and his reputation took a hit because of an incident called the Homestead Strike in which a number of people lost their lives due to a labor strike at one of his plants. And, and by the way, you know, he's going to establish his headquarters near, you know, a population center that's located relatively close to where there's coal mines and iron mines. He's going to turn Pittsburgh into Steel City, USA. So you ever wonder what the Steelers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, that's the reference. It's the references to steel. He eventually sells his company, um, <clears throat> his share in it, in 1900 for $492 million to J.P. Morgan. We're going to talk about him later. And from that point forward, and a lot of it has to do also with this incident that, that happened, um, he makes it a point, he is of the idea, put it this way, Carnegie was of the idea that even though he was a wealthy man, and I guess you could claim that he worked really hard to get to the top. He was not a fan of uh, ostentatious wealth. He was not a fan of idle wealth. He felt that wealth needed to be reintroduced into society. He was actually against inheritances. He was very much in favor of estate taxes. Um, he ends up giving away 90% of his wealth very little of it ends up of his children. So that would be about $350 million at the time that he was alive or uh, $4.8 billion today. Two philanthropic causes. Um, <clears throat> it, it's out of Carnegie. And he kind of wrote a book in 1899 to spell out, you know, his philosophy of life, the gospel of wealth. Um, and basically, the idea was that he, you know, he was not a fan of ostentatious living or inherited wealth, and that society was all the better for if these men that were fortunate enough to make fortunes uh, intelligently reinvest their wealth back into society. He's going to do it by pouring a lot of money, for example, into public libraries and to educational uh, ventures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and this kind of rubs off on some of the robber barons of his era, not all of them. Now, was it truly an act of altruism, or was it a public relations gimmick? Okay, that's 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 a that's a that's a topic of debate. One of the other things that Carnegie, um, other than you know being the father of the American steel industry is recognized for is for his ingenious ability to organize a business enterprise into an extremely efficient and profitable one. Um, Carnegie Steel was probably the first one that you could claim successfully that was called vertical integration. That's when a company buys up its entire supply chain. You understand, if you run a business, you know, whatever business that you're in, you're probably dealing with suppliers. And you're purchasing whatever you need, your supplies from these suppliers or their services 
but at a premium because they're in business also so they're, they're they're you're paying for you know their profits now what if you were to provide those services and those supplies to yourself becoming self-sufficient well then you don't have to pay that extra that extra actually goes into your company's pockets and you could actually pass off the savings to the consumer which makes you more competitive or in the form of dividends to shareholders which attracts even more investors so when a company takes over its supplies suppliers and distributors to gain total control self-sufficiency over every step of the manufacturing process um, as well as the quality and cost of its product so here's a good example of the way Carnegie Steel worked okay Carnegie Steel not only owned you know the coal the, the coal mines and the iron mines but also the steel mills and not only the steel mills but also the ships that would ship this steel as well as the railroads that's the distribution part and then all the money that was saved by providing its own you know supplies and distribution was passed on to the consumer making this company more competitive now let's switch um, gears here for a second so we got steel we got railroad remember this is before electricity and so you know i always ask my students in class you know in the 19th century how do you suppose people lit their homes or uh, heated their homes in winter well you know other than you know fireplaces there's not really that many you know alternatives um and so what you're seeing there a picture there would have been a um, an oil lamp there there were portable ones and also ones that were mounted on the wall so instead of the lamp that you have people had oil lamps now and, and also you know the same oil that would be used in oil lamps was also used in you know home heating portable heaters now what was the fuel that was used for you know to light homes and to heat homes well that that one gets a little complicated there was two options um for a very long time there was um coal gas which i don't know how in the world they manufactured it but it was coal gas and and a lot of cities would actually pipe this into homes and businesses um and so it was it was more of a gaseous feed into into the lamps short of that um certain oils that were known to burn clean and um of that use now here's the thing people don't know this what was once a lucrative industry in this country and which provided the fuel for much of the indoor lighting and heating in this country was whale oil yes we used to have whaling fleets that would harpoon and slaughter whales on the open seas and basically harvest their blubber to process into whale oil but we hunted these whales to near extinction they became harder and harder to find and that affected the price of this oil it became more expensive and so you know bright minds start to looking into alternatives is there an alternative to this whale oil and the alternative that's going to emerge is a product called kerosene now where in the world does kerosene come from and what was you know now these oil lamps eventually are going to start burning kerosene and these heaters are going to start burning kerosene. i'm going to say something real quick that it's kind of a fun fact ghost stories hauntings very popular in the 19th century okay many people claim spiritualism was very uh, was, was very much in vogue so were seances etc etc many people claim to have had experience with the supernatural or did they here's one thing that they forgot in the winter particularly in the winter when we close our windows because we don't want that cold air to come inside our homes well which means our homes are not as well ventilated and then we're at night we're going to turn on these oil lamps and these heaters and without realizing it whether it's whale oil or kerosene guess what we're releasing into our homes carbon monoxide so were they really seeing spirits and having experiences with the supernatural or were americans across the country 
basically having hallucinations because they were slowly poisoning themselves. Not enough to kill themselves, but enough to hallucinate on the carbon monoxide they were releasing in their homes. Okay, that was just a fun fact on the side. So, we need a substitute for that kerosene, which brings us to another one of the pretty abundant resources we have in this country, and we still do. Petroleum. Rock oil, it was called. This oil-like substance that came out from the ground, so it must be rock oil, or what you would call rock oil in Latin, petros oleum, or petroleum. Um, and in class, I discussed the, the qualities of this. It was it was viscous. It was uh, it was good for lubricating parts. You could light it on fire. It burned really dirty, but it stayed on fire, so it was flammable. And the Native Americans used to use it on their skin for medicinal purposes. It's not as crazy as you think. Um, in 1859, Edwin Drake successfully drills. Um, and reaches the first, you know, drills the first oil well in the United States. And before you know it, Titusville, Pennsylvania becomes the birthplace of the oil industry. It doesn't really stay there, but it becomes the birthplace of the oil industry. Now, remember that heating oil and that interior lighting oil that's becoming scarcer and more expensive, well, you know, scientific minds are going to start looking into this substance and refining it and distilling it and out of crude you create kerosene okay kerosene is a clear flammable liquid that is the product of paraffin which is the a, a waxy um byproduct um that's produced when you what they call fractional distillation of crude oil it's in the same family as the candle wax and Vaseline. All these are petroleum products. Yes, uh, the guys that worked on these early um, oil rigs, if you will, they noticed that a waxy substance would begin to build up on all the equipment. Um, it, it was a nuisance, but when they put it on their wounds, their wounds would heal easily and faster. Petroleum jelly. I'm not going to get into this, but a million applications came out of this. But the people that the people that invented kerosene and the people that gave birth to the oil industry are not the people that are going to make fortunes off of it. For that, we have to look elsewhere. Mr. John D. Rockefeller, the richest American that ever lived, and perhaps the richest person in all of modern history. And yes, adjusted for inflation, still wealthier than Mr. Jeff Bezos, believe it or not. Rockefeller um, <clears throat> had a rough childhood. His father was a horrible father. He was a con man, a philanderer. He would you know, show up and leave and show up and leave his mother was a devout baptist and, and john was a devout you know baptist as well and when he's a young man he decides to go into this brand new oil business the kerosene business and he finds this company you know he creates this company in 1870 called standard oil and standard oil goes on to become the first true monopoly in the united states we're going to talk about what that means or the term trust he ran it until 1897 and remained its largest shareholder up to its death, his death. By 1890, Standard Oil made up 90% of the U.S. refining business. <clears throat> he, he would go on to control his own distribution, very similar to Carnegie, by investing in warehouses, pipelines, and containers, uh, which would allow him to produce his product and price it more competitive than his competitors. Um, he considered himself a devout Christian who also believed in social Darwinism, that some people were inherently superior to others. And of course, since he was wealthy, you could imagine that he believed himself to be one of these superior individuals. And, you know, the social Darwinists believe that 
It was just strange. It's a bit of a contradiction. The, the government, even charity, should be discouraged. Because all you do is encourage the poor to have children and, and keep bringing more people into the world. You should actually just let, you know, let the let nature deal with it. It, it, it. There's a bit of a contradiction there. He was a ruthless, besides being a devout Christian, he was a ruthless businessman. He often employed blackmail, espionage, and price wars to drive his competitors into bankruptcy. By 1899, Standard Oil held stock in 41 companies. By 1911, Standard Oil was broken up into 34 separate companies under federal antitrust legislation. And as a result, Rockefeller actually becomes wealthier, becomes the first billionaire. At his peak, his net worth was approximately $1 billion, or $418 billion in 2019 dollars or 3% of the GDP at the time that he was alive. He would spend last, most of the last 40 years of his life in semi-retirement donating to philanthropic causes and foundations dedicated to medicine, education, and scientific research. Um, from Rockefeller's donations came the University of Chicago, Spelman College, the Rockefeller Foundation, um, he would end up donating over $500 million over the course of his life, which was half of his fortune. <clears throat> and so that's Rockefeller. And Rockefeller is the one that's going to live the longest of all of them. And, and since Carnegie knew he was religious and he was also a teetotaler, like Carnegie would mess with him and send him like bottles of booze as gifts. And Carnegie was the father of horizontal, I'm sorry, vertical integration. Um, Rockefeller was the father of horizontal consolidation. What did this mean? By outpricing his competition, um, he would basically drive them to the point that they could not price their, well, he's a couple of things. He invested a lot of money in making sure that kerosene, which was not known to be 100% safe, it did ignite and cause explosions at home and even house fires. He wanted a reputation of being the highest quality kerosene on the market, so he poured a lot of money in making sure that would happen, hiring the right scientists to make sure that would happen. So running on that reputation, and on top of that, he would be able to offer his kerosene to market at a much more competitive price than his competitors to the point that they couldn't match his price and they either went out of business and then he would buy their refineries. And he starts collecting refineries until eventually at the end, Standard Oil is pretty much the only game in town. And by definition is a monopoly. And here's an interesting graph that shows us, you know, Standard Oil's beginnings. What happened to Standard Oil as a result of antitrust legislation and where we are today yes standard oil is still around rockefeller standard oil is right, still around even though it was broken up into 34 smaller petroleum companies rockefeller still held controlling shares in every one of those small companies and over the years merged them and merged them and merged them until what we have today are basically the four big you know oil companies uh, that dominate the, the oil market today, and they all stem back from the original Standard Oil. So we had railroad, and we had steel, and we have oil. But what about the guy, I don't want to say just maybe the wealthiest one of them all. But there's something about the guy that holds the debt that puts him in a position that's more advantageous to everyone else. The bank. And this brings us to J.P. Morgan. And like many of the robber barons of his era, he didn't invent anything. Okay, He, he didn't pioneer anything. He was not the, the, the originator. Um, but he had the good fortune of being born into a lot of money. And using that to make even more money. And J.P. Morgan was possibly the most famous um, financier and banker of the Gilded Age. 
Um, and just to show you the type of guy, and all these guys did the same thing. Hey, did any of them fight in the, during the Civil War? No, pretty much they all paid substitutes. Uh, J.P. Morgan was no different. During the Civil War, this gives us a taste of J.P. Morgan. He, he bought 5,000 rifles from an army arsenal at $3.50 each and sold them to a field general for $22 each. That, that was the measure of his patriotism during the war. Um, but as a man of business and money and finance, he co-founded the New York banking house Drexel. And later he would rename it into the more familiar J.P. Morgan and Company in 1895. See, if we had more time, we'd go into this conversation about what exactly is banking. And so, uh, a long story short, Carnegie made his money selling steel. And then much of that money, he, he, he used it to buy other firms. But it was always to support the steel his steel business rockefeller made money selling oil uh, vanderbilt made money and and gould made money by laying down track and having people lay his rail i mean ride his trains so how do banks make morgan how's it how, money how's a guy like jp morgan make money when you deposit money into a bank how does the bank make money off of that so i'm gonna we're gonna do this real quick banks are businesses Banks make money, profit, if you will, by lending out money to people who borrow money. When people borrow money, they borrow that money plus interest. That is the charge. That is what the bank charges them to lend them money. Now, where does the bank get the money to do this? Well, in part, from the very people that deposited their money in the banks. So in exchange for a bank safekeeping my money, okay, the bank turns around and lends my money to other people. It's okay. They know they owe me, okay? This is how banks create money, by, writing, by, by underwriting loans and giving depositors money to other people. And then eventually that loan is going to be paid back in the form of interest. So that's one revenue stream the, that allows banks to generate revenue, profits, but it's not the only one. J.P. Morgan was an investment banker. He not only took depositors' money and lent it to other people, he also used it to buy stocks, okay? So that the bank itself is a buyer and seller of stock, and if the bank itself is buying stock, buy enough stock and the bank itself is now owning companies okay so it's not just traditional savings and loan we're going into investment banking and then now you have the bank actually owning firms and we have the bank owning uh assets and real estate and property and et cetera et cetera and all these combined increase the bank's revenue stream and by and by extension its profits and jp morgan was pretty much a master at this um, so yes, he, he co-founded JP Morgan and company, um, eventually he moves on to buy the Carnegie company in 1900. Like you said, he would unite it with other businesses and create us steel, the world's largest business organization. By 1901, us steel is the world world's first billion dollar company. By 1900, he owned or controlled numerous banks, insurance companies, AT&T, Western Union, 24 railroads, over 100,000 miles of railroad, half the country's mileage. And from 1890 to 1913, 42 major companies were organized or their securities were underwritten in whole or part by J.P. Morgan and Company. Maybe Rockefeller made a fortune in oil and Carnegie made a fortune in steel. But when Rockefeller and Carnegie and Gould borrowed money, guess who they borrowed it from? People like J.P. Morgan. And that gave him certain leverage that these other guys didn't have. This is not the end of J.P. Morgan's story. We'll keep talking about him in the future. J.P. Morgan was also instrumental in 
the creation of big business. Okay. Taking the firm and taking it to new heights. Of course, with the intent of generating greater profits. So in the Gilded Age gives us the rise of big business and, and the organization of business in new and complex ways um, to handle the complexities of industrialization and, and the incredible profits that this was going to generate. Corporations have always been around. But the corporation in itself, of course, is a product in its modern manifestation is a product of the Gilded Age. So what is a corporation? It doesn't have to be a large company. Um, but it's a company, um, long story, I think the first thing we should say is a corporation differs from uh, what they call a sole proprietorship. That a corporation could attract a lot of investment capital by selling pieces of ownership. We call these shares or stock. The more pieces of ownership it sells, the more stock holders it has that have a vested interest in the company and are entitled to a piece of the profits. They call this dividends. Um, corporations are often chartered by government, by the state. Um, they usually have many subsidiaries. They operate in several different businesses. A corporation under law is a separate legal entity than the flesh and blood people um, that are its owners, the shareholders. It often operates apart from its owners. Um, if you see this organizational chart, it's the stockholders that usually, through their stock, which doubles as a vote, um, votes in a board of directors, and that board of directors votes in a president or a chief executive officer. And you understand that the division of labor and speciality and responsibility is pretty complex. And so, you know, corporations are also not only you know, are they known for being able to attract large sums of money through selling shares of themselves, but also having pretty large and hierarchical um, organizational structures, okay? Now you're dealing with, you know, a lot of people having a lot of responsibilities in a very specialized and compartmentalized way in order to run a firm that is frankly so large. And, you know, if uh, if you're going to do that, you know, this is what, when do you think the birth of business administration, school, university starting to offer business administration and, you know, management came into being pretty much during this period. They figured if 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 the, if the firm was so large, the corporation was so large, employed so many people, then we need to train an army of people whose specific skill set is management on behalf of the owners okay managing the company on behalf of the owners who are the shareholders okay at a variety of levels depending on how much responsibility top level mid level or lower man and you know, this is where really the you know the study and science of business starts to take off we're not gonna we'll talk about charles taylor later and you know and in, in scientific management and how he uh defined you know change things if you will so so what we're essentially talking about is, is consolidations and combinations turning firms into bigger and bigger and bigger organizations at first the first thing they tried to do um was to put together a pool another word for this is a cartel an, inf an informal agreement between various companies that they're going to set prices at a certain price and they're going to respect each other's share of the market. Problem was, it was voluntary. Too often people would break this agreement. And so these cartels tended not to do very well or last very long. In 1882, they tried a different organization. And you have to be careful because in the late 19th century, the terms monopoly and trust were often used interchangeably but they're not necessarily the same thing if i just read off my slide a, a, a group of a trust is a group of people who by owning stock in several companies run those companies together under one unified you know group of of owners together as one large corporation 
Um, Standard Oil was the first one that, that, that played around with this uh, model, if you will. The shareholders would transfer their stock in different companies to a small group of trustees who would hold this stock in trust. In exchange, the people that transferred their stock to you know, the trust, to this group of people, received stock themselves, but it's a little confusing. It's like I sell my, I don't know, my stock in Central Pacific Railroad in exchange for, you know, stock in, you know, XYZ Trust, okay? And by holding all this different stock from different companies, this board of trustees, if you will, runs the tr the all these companies together as one one cor corporation. Um, <clears throat> so yes, and so they would be able to exercise unified control over nominally independent firms. Um, by the 1890s, due to state law, the trust goes out of fat. You know, not out of fashion. It was pretty much illegal. But it's seen as a uh, a means by which to undermine competition, blah blah blah, and so you get the holding company. The holding company emerges in 1889. Sounds very similar, but it's very different. Holding company doesn't produce anything. All it does is hold stock, okay, and buy stock and hold stock from other companies. Similar to the trust, but not quite, and then exercises ownership over several companies at once. So, so yeah, whether it be a cartel, which didn't last long, or the trust, or the holding company, what well, all of these companies essentially are trying to do, you know, and, and is gain the upper hand and end up winning the game. Let me say a couple of things b b before we continue. You have to understand that the Gilded Age, for anybody that, you know, professes a desire for an era of 100% unbridled, unfettered capitalism, this is it. It's the Gilded Age. No regulation, practically no taxes. Um, I would like to say laissez affair, but that wasn't true. On the contrary, the government was almost a partner. In these in these business ventures, well, you've probably been taught before. You know, one one of the necessary um, ingredients for a free market capitalist society uh, economy to succeed is you need competition, right? Competition drives innovation. Um, but here's the thing: in 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 an economy, if will, that you have competing firms, and they're all competing against one another and some of them are doing better than others, eventually, without any intervention, some firms are going to win, and some are going to lose. And sometimes one wins, and everybody else lost. And at that point, you have the inevitable end result okay, of all this competition. Capitalism has a tendency of creating its own antithesis. The firm that itself, by definition, kills competition. When a firm emerges to be so successful that it actually controls an entire industry, and I'm thinking of Standard Oil with 90% of the refining business in the country, it becomes the sole supplier, has no competitors, it controls prices, controls wages, keeps smaller firms from entering the market, suppresses innovation um and at that point we run into a problem by the end of the 19th century the u.s produced one-third of the world's manufactured goods we came to surpass great britain that was number one but one percent of the u.s corporations controlled a third of all manufacturing our economy was being dominated more and more so by monopolistic firms Okay, and you'd be surprised how much is, this is still true today. Perhaps even more true today than it was during the Gilded Age. Four reasons why monopolies are bad for the economy. The argument is 
They can set any price that they choose. Because of this, they can create inflation. They could supply inferior products, and because there's no competition, because it's hard to get into the market, there's nothing the consumer could do about it. They lose any incentive to innovate because they don't have to. They basically dominate the market. And, of course, they create inflation, which, which, which is, is, is this open to debate? Absolutely it is. What did the government do about it? Because the government's responsibility here they believe was to maintain competition. Maintain competition by going after the monopolies, so what they called antitrust legislation. First one is in 1886, and it's targeted at the railroads. The Interstate Commerce Act, because rail traffic falls within the purview of interstate commerce, therefore the government has the right to regulate this commerce, establishes the right of the federal government to supervise railroad activities and force them to adopt a standardized schedule of rates, something they did not have. Years later, the Sherman Antitrust Act is going to argue that any firm that is so large that it actually interferes with commerce, unfortunately, they also included labor unions in this. Any, co any company that by sheer size interferes is a force of interference with interstate commerce or international trade. Just that existence is a violation of federal law, is a trust or a monopoly, is legal, illegal, and the government can come in, regulate, or even break up this firm. Let's talk about the inventors. I'll introduce them real quick to you because we're kind of running short on time. Here we have Thomas Alva Edison, the you know, inventor of the light bulb, phonograph, motion picture, DC um, electric motor um, generator and electrical grid. And the company that he founded with a lot of the money from JP Morgan was General Electric. Remember Nikolai Tesla, once an employee of uh, Thomas Alva Edison, a um, Eastern European um, immigrant. He pretty much pioneered the idea of an alternating current. So he invented uh, an electric motor that generated um, electricity and alternating current, an alternating current distribution system. He was bankrolled by George Westinghouse, who made a fortune selling air brakes, something that trains really needed. Right up there, we have, with the white hair, we have Alexander Graham Bell. We all know that he is the inventor of the telephone which replaced eventually the telegraph if you don't know what that logo is that's basically the company that was founded by alexander graham bell at&t which stands for american telephone and telegraph the two other invent uh, individuals that were invent very rarely do the inventors become the tycoons but sometimes it happens george eastman george eastman invented Kodak, big company once upon a time, because George Eastman, for the first time, put the power of photography in the hands of regular people by inventing a handheld camera that anybody could use. Kodak number one camera in 1888, a simple box camera that came loaded with a hundred exposure roll of film. And then you had immigrant Gustavus Swift who himself created a meatpacking empire and reinvented the entire business of, of meat and raising cattle and getting meat to market by developing the first refrigerated rail car that would allow him to transport larger quantities of already slaughtered and prepared meat you know, saving on freight, you know, to, you know, nearby markets. And this company is still around today. And here's a picture of some of these early versions of these inventions. Uh, early typewriter, or the early telephone, one of the earliest light bulbs, uh, the Kodak number one camera, and a, switch, a swift um, refrigerated rail car. So a lot of wealth was created. So we'll go back to that first um, video that we saw. 
yes, the Gilded Age was a period of rapid industrialization, rapid wealth creation, and pretty much, you know, incredible rate of invention and innovation. But where did all that money go? And that was one of the not-so-golden parts of the Gilded Age, okay? When a small group of people, either through skill or luck or whatever you call it, were able to make great fortunes for themselves, but the vast majority of Americans, many of them uprooted from lives that they had lived for generations, did not enjoy this great prosperity. And so we had to talk about inequality during the Gilded Age, and it was marked and it was significant. Um, there's a, you know, whereas, you know, a couple of four, you know, a small percentage of the population lived in, in palaces and castles. Um, the vast majority of our urban population lived in tenements, in slums, um, and their work lives weren't much better. During the Gilded Age, about 2% of the population, the top 2%, earned 18% of all income. And the top 2% of the population owned 33% of all wealth. If you don't know what wealth is, wealth is income plus assets. Okay. And this diagram here shows us, you know, some of the, some of the poorest families made as little as $150 a year. Um, whereas some of the wealthiest families earned already a quarter of a million dollars. And, oh my God, but this is, this is horrible, right? So, and the 4,000 richest men own 20% of the nation's wealth as their own. Oh my God, this is horrible. You know, how unfair, what a gross, you know, misdistribution of wealth in society. Well, folks, it's worse now. As, as scandalous and obscene as this was during the Gilded Age, it's actually worse now. Today, the top 1% earns 20% of all income, so a little bit more than during the Gilded Age, and owns 30% of all wealth, so a little bit less during the Gilded Age. The 50 richest Americans today own more wealth than the 165 million poorest Americans combined. So much of the wealth disparity and inequality that existed during the Gilded Age, the numbers say it exists today. So why don't you see it? It's called consumer credit. That's what it's called. And bankruptcy laws, and there's a million other fail-safes that would not allow that kind of poverty, although there is poverty. But that's a subject for another moment. So yes, the lucky minority lived the life of privilege, of luxury, of, of lavish abundance. They lived in palaces and they traveled in high fashion, whereas the majority lived like this, particularly the majority of the urban working class in, in crowded, dangerous tenements, poorly ventilated fire hazards, okay? Not to mention dangerous factories and in a country that led the world in, in workplace accidents and deaths. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of political cartoons that emerged during this period. Um, you would have to stop the video and take a look at them and interpret them. But here's an allusion to, you know, the, <clears throat> The captains of capital, the robber barons of today, and their factories are really no different than the, the aristocrats and nobles of the Middle Ages. Uh, and much like the peasantry of the Middle Ages paid tribute, um, you know, the, the working class and, 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 and the small farmer and the small merchant of the Gilded Age would, you know, end up, you know, having to pay tribute to these robber barons as well. Here's the part that got under a lot of people's skin, and, and, and maybe we could have this conversation. Okay, fine, let's make the argument. You made your money because you were smarter, uh, more driven, et cetera, et cetera. 
and that's your money. You want to buy you want to buy palaces and you want to buy art and jewelry and 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 grand pianos and all that. That's your business. But what happens, particularly in a democracy, okay, when this wealth starts to be used to buy political power? When it starts to be used to buy favorable legislation? At the expense of the most vulnerable, at the expense that need the assistance of government the most, when the wealthiest among us use that wealth to undermine democracy, to undermine the democratic process, and basically turn government into an instrument that works for their interests at the expense of the interest of the majority working class and poor people of this country. And that's the illusion that this image is making. Here's another one. What is this image saying about Standard Oil and its power and its influence? We're not talking about material wealth anymore, the type that Carnegie didn't like. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about trips in Europe and sending your kids to the best schools and you know and, and mansions. We're not talking about that. We're talking about wealth now corrupting the democratic process. Okay? Undermining the democratic process, buying politicians, uh, enabling corruption, if you will. And why is it especially troublesome in a self-professed democratic society? And lastly, here's another one, very popular image. And, and notice the signs on the door, right? This is supposed to be the Senate chamber. And they captured the bosses of the Senate. So right there, what is the cartoon is saying? Who really runs the Senate? The senators or these big bags of money that are walking the back? There's, right, there's some signs. That this is a Senate of the monopolists by the monopolists and for the monopolists. So who do these senators work for? What was the argument that the set that this cartoonist is making? And notice the people's entrance is barred shut. Okay, so we talked about team capital today. We talked about the robber barons, the men that that built the industrial infrastructure, the backbone of this country that would allow it to become the economic powerhouse. That's one argument, right? These are the men that made America. But there is a rebuttal. There is a counter argument. And we kind of touched upon it a little bit today when we talked about inequality and, you know, and what good is it in the big picture in the long run when all this growth, all this wealth ultimately falls into the hands of a minority. We're going to talk about the rebuttal next time.